how many of you listening to this are registered with the Yoga Alliance because you worry that if you weren't registered with the Yoga Alliance, you would miss out on financial opportunities. But you know that what you had to do to get that certificate, that that 200 hours, that's not what made you a good teacher. You know that. But there's just this way that things have been done. And the idea that it could be done differently seems impossible. And it ties into so much. It ties into one of the things that we were talking about in my weekly teacher's class this week. This thing that yoga teachers still to this day tell people to do when they tell people to square their hips off, whether it's in a twist or in a standing uh, warrior pose. The squaring your hips. She was asking why. Why do teachers say that? And they ask that if you ask a teacher who teaches that, very often they will give you some answer like, oh, you're trying to have Tadasana in the hips. And It's the answer that they got in the teacher training. And if you delve more, if you say, but why, why do we want that? There is nothing else there because everything got boiled down to a standardized answer and that's the issue. So we were hashing this out this week and we were trying to figure out, is there another way? Is there another way we can language our classes? Is there another way we could organize ourselves as an industry, as a trade And more than anything, just to get clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if that's something that you're interested in, you're welcome to join us. It's the J. Brown Yoga Weekly Teachers Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. Okay. Hello. How are you? How's it going? How's your drive or your walk or your breakfast or whatever you're doing right now? It's lovely to be with you. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown and I am returned home. I am back in my studio in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Those of you who've been Tuning in over the last few weeks while I've been traveling out about in New Zealand and Australia. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about and you're new. If so, welcome to you. But for everybody else who's been kind of along the ride with me over the last few weeks especially, it's really great to be back. I have to admit I am a little bit out of sorts. I have been back for at least, gosh, it's four days now, but... I'm, I'm feeling a little bit uh, jet laggy. I didn't feel that way when I first got back. Like the first two days, I felt just fine. I was like, oh, no jet lag, I'm good. And then, I don't know, there's like some kind of delayed effect. And then the last day or two, I've just been a little bit uh, out of it, shall we say. And if you've been paying attention, if you checked out my blog last week on the heels of the Karen Rain episode, wow, I've... I've kind of been getting it from all directions. And I certainly ask for it. I'm glad that people are expressing their views. I, I appreciate the support. I also appreciate the condemnation. I pre- appreciate all of it, you know. I've certainly been learning a lot, but it's definitely been a bit exhausting. I'm certainly going to continue the conversation that I started about the Ashtanga community. And I would say that My big takeaway from that was that if I'm going to be an ally, if I'm going to say that I support survivors, then I need to be held to account for what I've done in the past. I need to be able to admit where I might not have been embodying the ideal I'm espousing. And then I need to correct that in my behavior going forward. That's what it would mean to be a real ally. And so... For all of its difficulty, absolutely a net positive, at least for me. I'm hoping for those of you who are tuning in and thinking about it as well. Now, last week, I put out the blog post on Yoga Alliance, and I just did not expect the reaction that I got from some folks. The sort of like whole Facebook group thing that came over to my website and I don't even really want to go into it. I just, I, I would say to any of those people who might be listening who were upset with me, I certainly wasn't trying to like steal credit. I don't think there's any question about who's taking credit for anything. I 
have been talking about and writing about Yoga Alliance for a long time. I, first, I wrote a blog post called Yoga Alliance Approved My Ass. Then Richard Carpell showed up. He called me up. He convinced me to give him a shot. I wrote another post called Giving Yoga Alliance a Chance. Then Richard left and I wrote another post called What Now Yoga Alliance? And then I just didn't, I just didn't even want to think about it. I had too many other stuff going on. I had like, I sold the whole center. Those of you guys who've been listening for a long time, remember like I had life momentum interceded and I didn't have any space to be thinking about the freaking Yoga Alliance, right? And then I sort of got, came into the podcast and that's right around when David Lipsius showed up a year ago, right? I didn't write any blog posts about it, but I brought him on the podcast and all those people on Facebook were upset. They were basically saying, you're a shill for the man. You're, you know, you're just part of the problem. And my feeling was that I, I wanted to be part of the conversation and I wanted to be doing that from the inside. I wasn't going to be some person on the outside taking shots, but I should be registered, I should be a member, and then I should be part of the organization and the conversation. And that's what I've sort of been doing, although for the last little while, I've just been incredibly conflicted. I am incredibly conflicted. And the things that I was pointing to in that article are new developments, I think. And I believe that we're going to find out more. I'm actually going to talk to some people and, and I'm going to have this conversation because I'm conflicted about it and I need to sort that out. And that's what it's about for me. I think I'm not the only one. And actually, today's conversation sort of starts that off for us some because Michael Demanicor, who is my friend from Australia, who I had this conversation with on a phone call, but then a few weeks later, just recently, I was in Sydney, Australia, and I got to hang out with him for a day. And he was as cool as I thought he would be in person as he was when I talked to him. And Michael was around in that early time when there was the Unity in Yoga meetings and the Yoga Lines first formed. And he was very involved in creating Yoga Australia. And he's been around and he was there back in that early form of time. We talk about it some. And we just talk about in general certain aspects of uh, yoga teaching. And I think that's a good start for us. Next week, I actually have a live panel discussion I recorded in New Zealand where they were talking about the, the standards for Yoga Alliance and Yoga New Zealand and the possibility of having yoga therapy standards. So all this is to say that I'm going to be developing this conversation some because I need to sort through it. So for whatever that's worth. Other than that, there's one last thing that <laughs> it's sort of silly, but I feel like I got to admit this, especially for longtime listeners who remember when I was talking in the past about not having a good life work balance and feeling neglectful of my children and my wife. Well, gosh darn it. I think I kind of fucked up a little. I don't know if, how bad, but I don't know. I've been away for three weeks. And when I got back, you know, my daughter, my eldest daughter, Rosalind, she's turning nine in like a week and a half or something. And I recorded a talk with her two years ago, right on her seventh birthday. Some of you might remember it. And she's just, I don't know. She's just grown into this person. And I feel like maybe this last year or two with all the stress of the move and worrying about money, like once again, I feel like I haven't spent enough time with her. I haven't, I have this fear that if I were to ask her about this period of time later in life, she's going to say, you were never around dad. And I'm, <laughs> So I got to do something about that. I really um, enjoy all this work I'm doing. I'm passionate about it. It fulfills me, but I don't want to feel like I wasn't there for her, for my kids and my wife. So I got to put some more priority on it again. Finding that, uh, that balance of you know not having my head in this freaking laptop all the time. Okay, so that was maybe a bit of a tangential thing, I know, but as I said, I'm a little bit out of it and just need to get everything off my chest so um, we can carry on. Before we do that and listen to this awesome conversation with Michael DeManicor, I am curious if those of you listening are feeling confident about 
your study of yoga anatomy because I know that in a lot of teacher training programs, sometimes the anatomy part of it, either it gets short shrift or frankly, it plays into this postural structural biomechanical model that I've been talking about. And if you were interested in some deeper study that might take you in a more biopsychosocial direction, I want to encourage you to check out today's sponsor, yoganatomy.net. That is the educational resource of Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews. They've both been on the show. They're incredible teachers. You should go listen to those episodes. I have learned from them and studied with them. And they have this fundamentals course, which is a 20-hour online yoga anatomy course that you can do as a standalone thing if you just want some continuing education, or if you conduct teacher training programs, you can plug it right into your existing program. That's what I've done in the past when I was doing teacher trainings. This is the yoga anatomy that I was using in my courses. So if you or someone you know is interested in studying yoga anatomy or maybe just want some deep yoga learning, I highly recommend going to yoganatomy.net. Also, I got just a couple of gigs. Let me drop them. I'm going to be in London, England, January 11th through 13th. I'm going to be in Tel Aviv, Israel, January 18th through 20th. You can find out about those gigs and more. You can listen to the archives of the podcast and read that blog I was talking about. You can also find all of my online yoga video offerings. Everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I think that's fine. Let's go ahead and get to this. Let's listen to this talk that I had with my friend, Michael Demanicor. Hello. Hello, Jay. Michael. Hi there, how are you? Doing okay. I'm getting an echo. Are you wearing any headphones right now? No, I'm not, but I can put a set on if you like. Yeah, if you've got them, it would be good. Yeah, no problem. Okay, we should be connected now. How's that? That sounds a little bit better. I'm not getting the same echo I was getting before. Okay. I'm in a large, uh, a large meeting room at the, uh, the university where I'm working, one of the offices here, so it is a little echo in my problem. That's all right. You know, we do what we could do. Yeah. You're, where are you right now? Uh, it's, it's called Nickham Health Research Institute. It's the National Institute of Complementary Medicine, which is part of the Western Sydney University. It's where I'm working in a postdoc position in uh, research and mind-body integrative medicine. Oh, yeah. So, well, that's, you jumped way too far ahead for this conversation. <laughs> But um, that's so you're at work right now. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, wow. It always freaks me out when I'm talking to somebody on the other side of the planet, and it's like already tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Michael, I'm glad we finally mad made this synchronicity of time and space happen. Yes. I got such a good vibe from you at the Desika Char event. And I thought, oh, you were somebody I thought maybe I should talk to you for that, but it didn't happen. And then I thought, oh, I'll just get to him another time. And I thought I was going to be going to uh, Sydney, which I'll hopefully get to see when I'm there in a few months. Yeah, great. Look forward to it. Um, actually, it's not that far away. It's not a few months. It's like a month. No. Wow. wow. It's like eight weeks till Christmas, and you'll be here well before that. Oh, my gosh. Crazy how time is rolling by. But Indeed. But I did get a, a great vibe from you, and, it, and it, my impression was, and I don't know, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that you were a bit of a pioneer in Australia. I only say that because I, I looked at like your bio and stuff, and I know that I first discovered Des Kachar and like his students um, in like maybe 2000, year 2000. Yeah. And I saw that you took your first trip and met him in 2001, but you also had a yoga institute in 2000. So I'm curious for you, when you, you clearly started yoga before you met Desika Char, what kind of practice were you doing before you met him? Okay, so, um, so I first started out, I was introduced to yoga here by some of the swamis from the Satyananda ashram. 
and uh, they've got they had a couple of ashrams here. I understand Satchananda, of course, uh, is much was much more established in Australia, not so much in the United States. Uh, but of course, you know, people know of uh, Satchananda and his teachings in the Bihar school in India. So I had the good fortune of, you know. Um, just taking some classes when I was at university and, you know, a bit of stress management and I, I did that for a while and really enjoyed it. And then, uh, you know, didn't get, didn't get the opportunity to go to classes for a while after that, but then found my way to Iyengar Yoga mm. and did uh, lots of regular classes and, you know, kind of I did my own home practice and, and, and home practice to me in those days meant whatever we were doing in class – I'd do it at home so I'd get better at it, so that when I get to class, I could do it better. That was kind of like my idea of doing a home practice in those days. So I did a lot of the Iyengar yoga, and I had some great teachers there. And then I moved from Sydney to Western Australia, and I did a training program with a teacher there that was kind of like an eclectic approach, if you like. You know, his background was um, Shivananda, Iyengar, um, we did some hot yoga before hot yoga was even, you know, even even heard of. All we did, with, you know, on the West Australian coast, uh, you know, in the summertime, we just closed the windows. <laughs> you know, the room was 40 <laughs> degrees, 45 degrees yeah, Celsius, of course. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Was um, it like so, somebody from, he, like, the gauche tradition, or did you guys just experiment with making it hot? Had you heard about that or something? Yeah, look, I don't know. This particular teacher, uh, I think he just heard about it. He was American, so maybe he had heard about you know, kind of this whole hot yoga thing. This was in the, um, let me just think now, This by, by this time it was kind of like the early 90s. Okay. So I started in the early 80s, you know, the Satchananda and the Iyengar throughout the 80s, and then when I moved to Perth, uh, so this was the early 90s. Uh, and then I really, you know, it, it was an eclectic approach. I loved it, got into the vibe of it, and, uh, you know, I, I was working full-time and I was studying at the university, and then I decided, you know, maybe, maybe I'll become a yoga teacher as well. So I, I studied with him, like under old school style, under the apprenticeship, you know, like a four year apprenticeship. Mm. With Mr. So with, like I'm sorry, the, where, who did you do your four year apprenticeship with? Uh, his name was Sam Weinstein. He was an American originally uh, from California. Although this is a, this, this, we don't want to go down this path too far because it will digress. Okay. Uh, but he he was from uh, he was from the Rajneesh. He was actually an SKP yeah. from Oregon. Huh. And found his way to Western Australia. And he, and as I say, so he was kind of like this whole eclectic approach. Um, of Shivananda, Iyengar, Hot Yoga, Osho, uh, and, you know, with great love of yoga and, uh, and human beings. And, you know, we just, it was just a great personality, great guy. And, you know, not, not, not really a formal approach to training, much more of an apprenticeship. So I studied uh, a long time and assisted and then became a teacher and, and, in fact, for a while ran his school, his studio when, in Western Australia. Was there a lot of yoga there at that time? It, it, it was starting to grow, yeah. <laughs> it was starting to become quite popular. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like I, I, I'm aware of your, your background in yoga too, and, and I think we share this idea that, uh, you know, we were into yoga at a time when it was only just starting to become popular. You know, the wave, the wave was only just starting to swell. And, you know, and some of my friends said to me who were not into yoga, but some of my friends said, they're just, you know, maybe you're onto a good thing here. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe there's a wave coming, you know. Well, you know, that's what I was going to sort of start was that recently I was talking to someone and they were suggesting, and I don't know how true this is because I've never been to Australia, that they actually felt like Australia was maybe like a little bit behind the kind of progression that New York went so that like in certain ways it was still experiencing more of a boom time there and like, and that like the power styles are, are really predominant. I think some of that has kind of um, subsided a little bit here in North America. I, I don't know if that's just my bias, but it does seem like, you know, the the booming, booming times have subsided and it's gotten harder. And I I wonder, from your vantage point, do you think, us, where do you think, us, is Australia still booming or are they also like where we are and now people are really kind of scrambling, you know? 
Yeah, look, it's, I think it is an interesting question, and I, and I am fairly familiar with the scene in the United States because I have spent a lot of time over there and, and hung out with a lot of yoga teachers and talked to studio owners and, and, of course, listened to, you know, people through your podcast and, you know, the whole discussion around that. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that yoga started to appear in Australia probably just as early as it did in the United States, you know, with some of the the pioneers way back in the 650s, 60s, 70s. But the boom that we're talking about, I think it did lag behind because the the early days of yoga came in Australia, came from people going to India. Mm. But the boom came from people going to America. See, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Not, not exclusively. Think, that's not altogether correct, but, you know, that was a predominant influence. But I agree because that's the sort of the distinction I have in my mind is that the teachers that I had, they all went to India and, like, met the gurus. Yeah. Um, and then came back. And then a whole other thing happened, you know, like a whole other commercial thing happened sort of yeah. out of that. Yeah. So I could kind of see how those are sort of different tracks in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I gave um, I gave a keynote address at the Yoga Australia conference earlier this year, and you know, part of that was talking about you know this whole boom and what made yoga popular. And you know, I think one of the key points there really is that what made yoga popular was what I described as a grafting of you know a, a slice of the tree of yoga. So you know, a, a cutting, in other words a cutting of the tree that was grafted onto Western culture as the rootstock. You know, I go through this whole agriculture analogy. We won't go into that now, but that the rootstock, that the, the, this, this cutting of yoga was taken, you know, from India, was grafted onto Western business, Western culture, Western education. And, and of course, a lot of that, you know, was really done in the United States and Australia pretty much, I think, followed suit on that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, we might have jumped ahead a little bit there, too. I want to go back to something. <laughs> no, it's okay. I do it all the time. I, I, I want to go back. Did you say that your first ever experience was, was it Shivananda or Satyananda? Satyananda. Oh, see, isn't that the one that had the big scandal? And Australia was where they, like, put it all out. Is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, look, that's, that's correct. It was, you know, I think there are, there are two parallel things here. Uh, in terms of that scandal, one was, you know, and, and I've heard you talk about this uh, with other people as well, yeah. you know, kind of the scandals in yoga in general, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of the fall of so many of the, um, you know, the big movements, whether they were guru or ashram based or just, you know, senior teachers, um, you know, so within yoga circles in general, there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, stuff that's been coming out. And then in Australia, you know, we had what's called a Royal Commission, a very, very large government investigation of childhood sexual abuse. And many, many different types of organisations, um, you know, were under scrutiny and that coincided, uh, you know, some stuff came out there about, you know, what was happening, you know, in, um, in particular in the Sachinanda Ashram, which is uh, located outside of Sydney. So, you know, it's very sad, very unfortunate. There was um, a fairly big political event around that yesterday where the, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia apologised, you know, to that, uh, you know, to the, the victims of that, uh, that childhood, in, what, what's referred to as institutional childhood sexual abuse. So there's two parallels here, what was happening in the yoga world in general and what was happening in institutions in Australia and most likely practically every other part of the world, it's just that we happen to have had this, this Royal Commission here. So those two coincided, which really did, you know, kind of put the spotlight on, um, you know, what was happening or what did happen all those years ago in the Sachinanda Ashram, yeah. Well, I mean, there's all the stuff coming out in all of the traditions. <laughs> all That's correct. of the, like hierarchical, structured, top-down uh, wisdom tradition or lineages have really experienced these, these problems and these issues. And um, I guess yeah. I think that that Royal Commission was very helpful in exposing how this stuff happens and how it kind of gets covered up. Oh, in indeed. Indeed. It's, uh, you know, it's now, of course, it's... Uh, it's, um, you know, much more recognised as, you know, like a, a real, you know, tragedy on the way we as a community allowed that to happen as, as well as the perpetrators who actually were involved. 
Yeah. Well, do you, I always have to ask, did you, when you were there, was, did you ever hear anything about any of that kind of stuff or did you ever see Oh, anything? I wasn't actually at the ashram. Okay. No, I was, um, I was, uh, uh, simply teachers from the ashram came to, uh, you know, I, I went to classes at a center that they were running and they used to come and visit, you know, where I was living. And we, you know, as one of the university colleges actually studying, uh, in the Catholic church myself at the time, I was, um, you know, studying in a religious order and, that, that's kind of like my background in the 80s. So I was doing yoga and studying at university, at the University of Sydney, studying psychology, and I was living in a religious order at the time. And all those things come together. So we had, which is very unusual at the time. That yeah, we wait actually, a second. Can we, can we stop there for a second? Um, when you say <laughs> I was that, trying to grow through that. I know, but I'm, just, I'm curious because you say living in a religious order. Does that mean you were like working towards becoming a priest? Yeah, correct, yeah. Yeah, but That's I decided it. that wasn't the life for me. And I was very, uh, I was raised a Catholic yeah. and my family was Catholic and I went to a Catholic school and, you know, I thought I'd, you know, at a young age, the age of 18, I thought, you know, look, I, I felt a calling and I thought I'd give this a try and, um, uh, you know, so I did and I, I pursued that for a while and then, you know, after a while I decided that wasn't, uh, that wasn't my calling. And when did you know that? Like, why, what was it that you were like, oh, I, I, I think this is not the right direction? Uh, the, the, the joke that I make about it, you know, really is just simply that I like girls too much and the whole idea of, <laughs> of uh, yeah. you know, I could see you know. that could be a big hold up at a certain point. I yeah, know, I, what I will say is I spent a, a, a couple of years in my early twenties being celibate because I thought based on what I had read that that was what you were supposed to do to become yeah. like enlightened or something. And I really wanted yeah. to like become enlightened or something. And so I did that in really earnest. You know? And yeah. I would say that there was some benefit in a certain regard to being able to exercise discipline or whatever. But ultimately that proved to be a very unhealthy situation for me that I also had to exit from. <laughs> you know, I had to stop yeah. meditating and go get a girlfriend at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was broader than that. You know, I really felt the calling, you know, I really wanted to be a dad and I really wanted to have a family and, and so that whole way of life, you know, it, 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 I don't regret one moment of it. You know, there was, I learned a lot. There was lots of stuff that happened. Uh, that was my journey. And, um, and to some extent, yoga was very much a part of that. Certainly meditation was a very significant part of that. Meditation and spirituality were very much a part of that. And I was studying psychology, as I say. Um, so a lot of those things actually came together. So they were very much a part of my formative years as a, as a young adult, um, but yeah, the, the calling to family life was, you know, ended up being much stronger than the kind of the idealism of, you know, of being, uh, you know, young in my early twenties. And how did your folks take it? Uh, look, I think, um, you know, like, like most loving parents, they, at first they were, you know, kind of a little concerned, but then all they, you know, all most parents want of their children is, is to, to follow their, you know, their calling and, and whatever makes them happy. So they came to terms with it and they were very, very supportive. And then they got used to the idea. And then when I decided to leave, I, I think the same thing. They raised some questions about, you know, is, is this what I really wanted to do to leave? And then, you know, it's because a long, a long process of discernment, both to join and then equally to leave. And then very, very supportive when I left and have, you know, been supportive ever since. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, loving parents, that's what they would want of, uh, of any of their kids to, to find their calling, find what, uh, what they want to do with their lives and, and to be happy. All right. And you, you found your way to yoga. Yeah. <laughs> and last that's we right. were there, you were, you were taking a young art classes and doing your best to do best stuff at home. And so, yeah, and in fact, that was it's a funny story. Actually, if I could just go there for a yeah. second, I used to almost like sleep, sneak out of the monastery on a Saturday morning with very few people knowing to go to the local yoga class. Ah, <laughs> oh, so you were doing yoga on the down low while you were in the seminary. Yeah, pretty, How about that? Yeah, yeah, they, they, I think they kind of tolerated it, but they introduced us to it, you know, as a way of stress management and a way of deepening our own meditation practice and our spiritual journeys. So they very much encouraged it uh, as part of our community life. Um, but when some of us, you know, took to it uh, with a little more, you know, earnest, with a little more enthusiasm, as I did, 
uh, then it started to become you know, a little bit more concerning. And and that was actually part of the the discernment process for me to to leave religious life was that, you know, I started to see I was, uh, you know, as well as yoga, I was studying, doing some postgraduate studies in religious education and I studied all of the world's major religions and I I started to question not only the, you know, the calling to religious life and community life and celibacy for me, I started to question a lot of other things about uh, about Catholic teachings. And part of that was because of my exploration of of yoga teachings and also, you know, of other religious approaches and other religious traditions. And that, you know, inevitably, so it wasn't just about family life, it was about a whole questioning of the necessity of of celibacy and religious life as a spiritual path. You know, like you were saying for yourself, it's, uh, you know, so it, it's often there is an idealism and I started to question that idealism. Mm-hmm. I hear you. And I think for me, it went from trying to kind of get to an idea of a sort of transcendent consciousness or a transcendent yeah. place and more about integrating like, Oh yeah, this is it right here. This life, yeah. this thing here, <laughs> this thing I've yeah. been not dealing with while I've been meditating. <laughs> yeah. A much more, a much more embodied experience in an integrated embodied experience in the full sense. Yeah. And that's why it also makes sense that we might've gotten into doing asana work, you know, like, Sort of like getting into the body, you know. Yeah. So you're doing. So let, me, let me just finish yeah, off that that journey to, um, you know, to you know my background in yoga itself. So while I was living in Western Australia, I was I was keen to do more studies, and I went to the United States to do. So by this stage, I was working as a psychologist and you know part time teaching yoga. So wait, so wanted, after you after you finished seminary, you got a psychology degree, or did you already have that? I actually I actually got my first psychology degree while I was in in the religious order. Okay. So they, they this was at the University of Sydney. So I completed my my initial training in psychology at Sydney University while I was living in the community. Oh, okay. Which cool. again was a little unusual, you know, and yeah. uh, and of course that that was part of the whole challenge. I mean, you had like a job plan after. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. I had a job yeah. So yeah, I finished my degree in psychology. I actually did my honors thesis in the mind body connection. And of course that also raised uh, you know, gave me a really good foundation for further exploring yoga and yoga teachings and yoga sutras and yoga philosophy, not just as a practice, but uh, you know, the philosophy behind it as well. So so that was part of my training while I was there, while I was in the community. And then when I left, I moved to Western Australia, did my uh, my master's degree in psychology and um, started working. I got a job as a psychologist. Uh, I was working with sc- in schools as a, as a, uh, a school psychologist. And, and that's where I completed my apprenticeship to become a yoga teacher. Yeah. And my, on, my master's degree, my research in my master's degree was also in the field of yoga. I did my research in the area of how yoga practice affects the way people see themselves as a, in, in self-concept, which, of course, I didn't know at the time, but now I know is so much related to the central issue in the Yoga Sutras of Asmita and, you know, the development of self-identity and ego and, and self-concept and how yoga practice. So I explored that in my master's degree in psychology in my research project. Mm, so these things have always, like, run in parallel for you your like yeah, psychology so. and academic study and then like your yoga practice they've sort very of much so. been yeah. hand in hand yeah. from the beginning it's not like you really yeah. went from one to the other they both kind of happened side by side that's correct yeah and a lot of overlap was happening there yeah oh, all right yeah. so so you you ended up you were at a younger classes but i still haven't found out how you got to desica char okay so let's go there I was living when I was living in Western Australia. The teacher that I had, who trained me up to become a yoga teacher, my initial training, as I say, was this whole eclectic approach, predominantly Iyengar, but as I say, very much influenced by other other approaches. And then I wanted to do more study and and went to the United States and did Joseph LePage's 
uh, integrative yoga therapy training. Mm. And, and that was great. And so that was kind of like my introduction to, you know, to further studies at, uh, in yoga therapy. And part of that training, so this was in the mid-90s, uh, and uh, part of the training was reading the book of The Heart of Yoga, which was the first time I'd come across Desika Chah's teachings. Me too. And in Same fact, experience. You read that book. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and you know, it kind of blew me away. It, and what I realized, and, and I often, you know, this is, I can talk about this, and it's a little embarrassing to talk about it, that I'd been practicing yoga for many years. I was now, you know, a, a reasonably accomplished part-time yoga teacher, and I knew very little about yoga philosophy and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And it wasn't really until I read that book and I thought, oh, my God, I've been practicing and teaching yoga all these years and I actually don't really know that much about yoga and what the system, what I describe as the system of yoga. I knew lots of techniques and lots of practices and, you know, I could do lots of asana and pranayama and, of course, I've been doing meditation for years, but I actually didn't know much about the philosophy behind it and uh, what the system is all about in terms of understanding the human condition and, 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 and what yoga practice actually offers us. So it was the reading of that book that was a real turning point for me. And that's interesting because that book isn't necessarily heavy on philosophy or sutras. It's a pretty basic practice yeah, book indeed. in many regards. I guess it has the sutras in the back and whatnot. Yeah. But the tradition, yeah. the tradition relies heavily on the sutras. And, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. Though, like, I think, and we can get to it, that, I mean, the Desikachar teachings of the sutras are different than other people's teachings of the sutras, in my experience. Yeah, indeed. Very Not everybody much so. teaches them the same. Very much so. <laughs> Very much so. And, I, and that's kind of like a specialty of mine now. I teach a lot of a lot of programs in the sutras directly, um, but I very much te- teach it from a, a you know understanding human psychology. Mm. And, you know, the whole mind-body connection, and as you've heard already, you know, that's very much a part of many years of academic study and research and philosophy. That's brought oh, all well, that. we'll, we'll get to that postdoctoral yeah. work that you're doing. I want to hear more about how you read the Heart of Yoga book, and then yeah. you're like, how does it, how, I'm going to go to India and meet Deskachar, yeah. or how does it go? How does it go? Yeah. So then from, from that training program, I went home and, you know, continued to read the book. I think I read it cover to cover several times. And, uh, and then I met Mark Whitwell, who was traveling and, and doing a workshop in Perth, where I was living at the time. And, uh, you know, really had a great connection with Mark. And by that time, Mark was no longer really going to India. And, and of course, I knew that Mark was the, you know, pretty much the editor and, and a really significant influence behind the, uh, the first edition of The Heart of Yoga. Uh, you know, we know that. Uh, and I had a really great connection with Mark and, and you know, wanted to pursue this teaching tradition, this lineage more. And, you know, we talked about, and I talked about, you know, going to India and, and, and studying with Desika Char and, you know, Mark said he really wasn't going there anymore and he didn't know that Desika Char was taking any students. So it was kind of a bit deflating in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it, things took a turn and I moved from, from Western Australia, I moved from Perth back to Sydney. And it wasn't long afterwards that there were teachers from the KYM coming to Sydney to do a workshop. And there was a lady from Melbourne, a wonderful teacher named Barbara Bryan, who was based in Melbourne. She'd been studying with Desika Char for quite a few years already. And she brought out some of the senior teachers from the KYM, the Krishnamachara Yoga Mandaram, which, of course, Desika Char was the founder. So I went along to this workshop and I was at a bit of a loose end. You know, I, I, was, I wasn't working. It was kind of like a gap year, uh, you know, like a how old was I? I was in my... Mid, by this time, I was in my mid thirties, uh, and it was a bit of a gap year between jobs. I'd moved back to Sydney. I wanted to put more work into becoming a yoga teacher, maybe starting a school. Still working as a psychologist now in private practice. It was a bit of a gap year, so I met these teachers from the KYM and thought, I really want to go to India and study with these guys, whether I can study directly with Jessica Chow or not. So I spoke with them about it and they said, yeah, come over and, you know, we'd love to have you. And um, my partner, Lisa, she she was very supportive of that. And we were going to go together for an extended period and live in India and uh, and study at the KYM and, and hopefully meet Jessica Chow. Uh, 
And then we soon afterwards found out that Lisa was pregnant with our first child. So, you know, there was a big decision there. So we decided that I would go by myself for a shorter time. And I went over and did a study program there. And I met Desika Char and he, we did a, a study program, which was quite common where, where people who had a connection with the KYM would take students from their own country to India to do like an intensive study program at the KYM. And so we did that, and Desika Char agreed to teach part of that program himself. So we would go from the KYM, we would walk, you know, it was like 100 metres, 100 yards down the road to their home, and we would have a class with Desika Char every day. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the focus of that was on meditation in yoga. This is back in 19, when was it? I think it was like 2000, 2001. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I've, I've just felt this great connection with Desika Char and, and, you know, we left it at that. Um, so that tell was me my... about those classes, though. Like, were you, when you say they were focused on meditation, was he lecturing? Were you doing breathing and moving? Were you sitting? What, what did those classes, what, what did they take? What form did they take? So we were doing, uh, so the study program was at the KYM. So we would be doing classes and practices at the KYM with, with their, their senior teachers and then in the afternoon, we would have like, you know, an hour's class with Desika Char, which included lecture, um, yoga philosophy, yoga sutras, and practice. And it was very, because the focus was meditation, it was, it was very simple, breath-centered meditative movements that would then take us into, you know, deeper meditative practice. So it was almost like the, you know, the breath-centered movements that we were doing were a warm-up and a lead-in and a preparation to then do seated pranayama and then further deeper into meditation practices. So it was a combination of, of lecture, particularly around the Yoga Sutras, and and then practice that was, you know, the whole vinyasa krama of simple asana, breath-centered asana, into pranayama, into meditation. And when you say meditation, like, I want us to try to clarify that because people mean different things. And I have yeah. um, had the opportunity to work a little bit with Chase Bosart, who was also yeah. a very close student of his. And, and a very he, good friend of mine. Oh, you know Chase. He's awesome. He's uh, supposed to come back on. Well. He's supposed to come back on the podcast. It's been a long time since I talked to him. But yeah. I, um, you know, when he like teaches a meditation, yeah. it's it's very different than like other kind of meditation classes I've taken, where he's using sort of like bring. He'll use certain imageries, like choosing like a rock or like I, I yeah. don't know, he, he's and and. He's making those choices in a sort of thematic way sometimes. So yeah. when we say that, that was in certain ways kind of a lead thing. It wasn't like a guided meditation where someone was taking you through body scanning. Yeah. But it was sort of like imagery. Is that right? Is that what you mean when you say meditation practices? Uh, I would say it includes that. Yeah. So. You know, I would describe a very, very simple definition of meditation, if we, if we can just start with that, is it's whatever we choose to focus the mind on. Mm. And that could be, you know, it could be a, a meditative component of movement. So, you know, I would say mindful movement in asana has a meditative quality to it. Right. And then similarly, you know, a lot of, what people experience as a meditation practice, say, might be um, a breath-centered, so the, a breath-centered meditation. So the focus, the object of focus in the meditation practice becomes the breath. And, you know, that's done in a lot of mindfulness practices in Vipassana. You know, the breath becomes the focus of the attention of the mind, and that's the focus. And then there's a whole range of other possibilities. It could be a meditative focus on sound or an object, and the third chapter of the Yoga Sutras explores this in great detail. So a lot of what the way Desika Char taught, taught us meditation really comes from an understanding of the, you know, what, what's referred to as the antaranga of the eight limbs, the top three limbs from, uh, well, it's, you know, the transition from pranayama to pratyahara into dharana and dhyanam. Mm-hmm. And then that goes into the the third chapter of the yoga sutras and the whole of the third chapter is talking about different types of things and objects and concepts 
um, that we could focus on as a mechanism to bring about a change, not only to train the mind to be more focused, but to actually what you focus on changes the way the mind and the brain works. And of course, we could explore this in a lot of detail in neuroplasticity. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I love the metaphor Desika Char used to use, you know, very much in the early days, long before I was studying with him. Have you come across a book that Desika Char was actually not really a book that he wrote? It's a transcript of some seminars that I think he gave in Switzerland um, that was called In Search of Mind. I am familiar with that. It's like a smaller, uh, smaller little book, right? It's not yeah, like it's a very tiny little transcript of the seminars, right? And in that little book, he gives this, this kind of this lovely idea of the nature of the mind and, and what meditation is really all about. And I think it's very, very consistent with our understanding of neuroplasticity today and, and you know, neurophysiology. And that is the mind becomes what you feed it. And that creates the networks, the neural networks of, of within the brain. Of course, the mind is much more than the brain. So whatever you choose to focus on, that creates the shape so that the, the it's like a uh, the shape like, it's like blowing glass if you like you know you can blow it into many different shapes and if you focus on different types of objects that resonate with the kind of qualities that you wish to embody then the choice of those objects become really quite significant and that's what the whole of the third chapter of the yoga sutras is all about so that's why i think Chase was doing there in in that process of meditation, and I think what a lot of people experience in meditation is, in fact, what I would describe as beginner's meditation, preliminary meditation. Well, I would say that a lot of what you're describing and this idea about meditation, it all hinges on one very specific thing, and it's what I meant when I said that Desika Char taught sutras different than other people. I just yeah. finished a history and philosophies of yoga course with a really wonderful academic guy. I, I'm going to bring him on. His name's Seth Powell, and it's really good. But the, the, the very classical definition, and this is from, I believe, the second one, is, you know, the definition of Nirodaha. Yeah. That is the pivotal thing because most yeah. <laughs> people, most people define, and that was what Chase's whole, see, his whole thesis was on, was on yeah. the definition of that word because so yeah. many people define that to mean some kind of stilling or cessation yeah. of the mind. Yeah. And, yeah. and the way that he's just defining it, Deskachar was defining it was as a directing of the mind, which is what yeah. you're saying, which is that Indeed. the directing Indeed. of the mind is yoga. And that's because that directing of the mind shapes you, shapes your mind, shapes the, the neuroplasticity and all the rest of it, right? Indeed. Absolutely. So I just gave, I've just come back, I've just returned from a, th- a three day training program. Uh, and the focus was all around uh, the Yoga Sutras, and it was exactly this. This was central. This same topic was central to you know the last three days of teaching that I've just been doing. And look, you know, how many hours have we got to really ex- explore the differences of translation and interpretation of what that particular sutra means and what that particular word means? And I think let me just clarify one thing. This this doesn't just come from Desikachar. It really comes from Krishnamacharya. And, of course, what Desikachar taught was very much his own understanding of his own studies with Krishnamacharya. And, you know, look, I don't want to go, you know, too hard on, on blowing the trumpet of, you know, the lineage here. But, you know, Krishnamacharya, you know, is a guy who is considered, you know, one of the most authoritative, both scholarly and practitioners of yoga of the entire modern era and was conferred the equivalent of seven honorary PhDs. And he was the one who really challenged a lot of the popular notions, not only in the translation into English, because he didn't challenge the English translation. He was challenging a lot of the Sanskrit interpretations of the time that the word nirodha meant cessation and that chitta vritti nirodha meant the cessation of the fluctuations or the modifications of, of the mind. It's Krishnamacharya who challenged that notion. Well, you know, so you what, know well, I'm going to jump in for a second just to say when I had Sri Ram on the podcast, he specifically told this story about how he he saw he had like a Sanskrit 
teacher who was very yeah. considered like this really you know advanced and like very renowned sanskrit teacher and he got to see his teacher have like a meeting his teacher wanted to meet krishna macharya cuz shri ram yeah. was studying there and he watched how much more proficient krishna macharya was than his teacher and how and <laughs> and the sort of like the brilliance of krishna macharya like yeah. was very apparent yeah yeah so you know to some extent all of us are rel- no, well, not to some extent. I think exclusively, all of us are relying on, uh, you know, rely the reliability of the translations and the interpretations, whether it's from the Sanskrit or the translation into English. You know, we're really relying on the sources of where that's coming from. And, of course, there are many different people with different backgrounds and, you know, their own particular, you know, biases. I've got a whole collection of different translations uh, of the Ogasutras. Well, there's a whole yeah. new there's a whole new world of scholarship happening right now, too. You know, the whole yeah. Hatha Yoga Project. So, I mean, it's still in the works, but it is all, and that's an important point. I always make that point is you can't, you can't just pick up one translation that you got at the bookstore, really. Like, that's... <laughs> That's not the whole picture. (laughs) Not even one person. So, for example, you know, what we have in the heart of yoga, and as you say, the the translation of the sutras that Desikachar, you know, it it was originally published in another format. And and then there's the whole story about, you know, his connection with Colgate University and, and Chase was very much a part of, of all of that, you know, all that background as, as was uh, Gary Craftow and, and a few others. Um, and what we have in, in Deskachar's first translation of the Yoga Sutras, then you spend time with Deskachar and he teaches about the Yoga Sutras is very often even different from what he wrote in that particular translation. Yeah. So it's not only one particular, or, or sorry, comparing different people's translations that went to print. It's then a whole kind of dynamic conversation around the exploration, you know, which happens best, you know, when you can have, you know, conversation and uh, and ideally, you know, a well-educated teacher rather than just the print version that comes from the book. And, you know, like they're helpful, of course. Um, but, you know, it was that exploration with Deskachar as a teacher and other teachers from the KYM that really brought the sutras to life. And in particular, this translation of the, you know, that second sutra of the first chapter Um as I say, this is you know worthy of hours of further exploration. No, I know. Well, you know what I really like. What I, stands out to me about what you just said is that you're kind of saying that. I mean, one, it's almost a little bit confusing the idea that he it was one way in the book, but he taught it other ways later. But I think I understand what you're saying because you're saying that much like science, the sutras aren't like fixed, and so of so. The, the the written translations might point to something, yeah. But that something that they're pointing to, that's not the thing. It's like when Amy Matthews says, "The map, not the territory." Yeah. So you can have a translation that's kind of a map, but the yeah. actual territory of what the map is supposed to be guiding you in only happens yeah. actually in relationship, like between people, and Indeed. the kind of subtle, nuanced, interpersonal things that happen in yeah. that. And that's yeah. actually the territory in which you learn and understand whatever those sutras are supposed to be pointing to. Indeed. And the first sutra actually says that. The first sutra, Atta Yoga Anushasanam. The word Anushasanam is what you're, you're describing right here. Is that, you know, we actually, there's two things in that word that I think are really important. One is that, yes, It's the guidance that we gain in our exploration, you know, whether it's a teacher or conversation. Of course, teachers can come in many different forms, including books, of course, and different books. It's that it's not just our own personal, uh, not, not just our own kind of personal take on it and which one we like. And then secondly, it is our own personal take on it because it's something that must be experienced, So the territory that you're referring to, the territory really is our own experience, our own embodiment of these teachings. And that opens up the whole darshana and what the purpose of the the purpose and the the um, the direction that the darshana takes that we will only, you know, I often use it. uh, The analogy is like learning to swim. 
you know, you can read all the books in the world about learning how to swim, but you will never, ever understand swimming unless you get in the water and start to swim. Okay. And that's what that word anushasana means. And generally it works best and we deepen our understanding experience when we have someone other than ourselves. But we do need our own experience. And of course, Mark. Mark if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.